I'm cinematically sizzling, insinuate my truth within. So I syllabify my past endeavors just to syncopate these lifelong lessons, lingering lucid, a verbiage tree, derived in me where poems began to percolate so recklessly, dropped out this spout so subjectively, hexagons and platypus, eclectic selective concepts that may appear as reciprocals, sounds like esoteric cryptic pools of whirlwinds and tailspins and gadgets and gizmos aplenty. You want thingamabobs? I got 20,000 ideas right now. I'd be a lot safer as a face-painted clown. Clown, clown as a face-painted clown. And good old Mother Nature allows me to sip this coffee, ethically sourced nurture, grounded in the earth, parched but perched, so I can finally rest my legs. Disperse these words that leak as perspired watercolor droplets speak in different demeanors of decibels that Hippocrates may have subscribed to with his medicinal care package of anecdotal earned class act, half apple cider, half metaphysical, propped his long-lasting visceral, inward, unlearned knowledge. So pay attention, because now I'm going to begin what I really want to say. I am not my mind, and my body is only an arbitrary design inclined to lead me to deceitfully believe that it too is me. When thinking about the topic of obsessive compulsive disorder, I want you to think about the thoughts that come to your mind. Hand washing, perhaps, color coding your hangers, extensive cleaning, an over organized and well kept room. <sighs> you know, most days I can't even begin to describe what it's actually like living with obsessive compulsive disorder. Imagine a mind that if you say left, well, <laughs> then it says right. I constantly feel like I'm in an argument with myself. It's like I'm putting my car in drive, but I'm going in reverse. See, my mind loves to play the devil's advocate, and its favorite question in the world is, what if? When I'm in my house and I pass by the stove, I worry, what if I carelessly forgot to turn off the stove? I would hate to be responsible for burning down my apartment. When I go to get dressed, I'm about to zip up my pants, but see, my zipper gets stuck. And I worry, it doesn't feel right. Could something bad happen to my mom? I'm at the mall, and I have to use the public restroom, and I am disgusted with the fact that there are pee drops on the toilet seat. The first thing that I tell myself is, is urine sterile? I repeat, is urine sterile? Because, see, my mind is telling me that if I'm in close proximity to someone else's urine, then I'm going to get a disease. I'm typing up a paper for school. And in my peripheral vision, I notice the computer USB cord. I instantaneously jump out of my seat. Was that a rat tail? So let me just tell you guys real quick that I have this huge, like, phobia of rats and mice. So for me, a computer cord is a rat tail. Close enough. So in order to be okay, I have to remove the cord from its socket multiple times and repeat, cord, 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 hoping that my brain will accept what it sees. <sighs> I remember this time I was eight years old, and my dad went to kiss me goodbye for school, wishing me a lovely day. And that day, he had like a two-day scruff, like he didn't shave. And his facial hair touched my soft eight-year-old skin, and the first thing my eight-year-old mind told me was, what if my dad's facial scruff transferred onto my cheek and imputed hair growth in my skin? Crippled by the fact that I could have a beard as an eight-year-old, <laughs> I continued to scrutinize my face in the mirror. Nearly a decade later, I entered an obsessive-compulsive outpatient program, working with some of the top doctors in the nation who had specifically studied the nature of OCD. And they told me that I had to do exposure and response prevention therapy. And what this essentially meant was that I needed to be exposed to my bizarre obsessive thoughts. 
So here's an example. I have this rat phobia. So maybe at some point in my therapy, there would be a rat in a cage, in a cage, and I would come closer to it, and the idea was that I would learn to habituate to this anxiety and this uncomfortable sensation. Okay, you get the idea. So um, basically, even though my OCD is not limited to any one particular theme, at that time, one particular theme that continued to cycle through my mind was whether or not chocolate, if poured on my thighs, could seep through the epidermal layers of my skin and make my thighs bigger. Now, as embarrassing as that sounds, can you guys guess what my therapy assignment was? Yes, it was literally to buy a bottle of Hershey's chocolate, quite literally pour it on my thighs in therapy, rub it in, and sit with a doubt and uncertainty of not knowing what was going to happen. These are thoughts that flood my mind upon awakening. Half the time I know that my heart doesn't care about these thoughts, but my brain does. When I was first diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, I told a therapist, who by the way had studied at Harvard, that I couldn't possibly have OCD. From the stigma that I understood, OCD is for people that clean, organize, and wash their hands. So naturally, I thought I didn't have this. My thoughts were racing, incessant, and caused great physical and mental discomfort to me. And not only that, my thoughts were not limited to any one particular theme, but rather anything and everything could somehow trigger my brain and become OCD. So my thoughts were so bizarre that if my OCD demanded that I lick a doorknob 28 times so that nothing bad would happen to my family, well, then guess who was stuck licking the doorknob? <sighs> Knowledge got me nowhere, just a more active mind to possibility. Blinking, ticking, tapping, sounding out my T's so that my brain felt assuaged, repeating sentences, repeating sentences, repeating sentences. A humbling disorder. I could hardly swallow my own saliva without fear of something horrific taking place. Whether my thoughts are the result of a neurological malfunction or an active imagination is irrelevant to the fact that I am still stuck in the pain of the way these thoughts hit my brain. I dropped out of college twice. Medical leave. <laughs> well, how do you explain to your professor, your boss, your family, and your friends that you are unable to commit to a punctual time frame due to checking, rechecking, and, well, checking again? Sorry I was late. I had to jump up and down 19 times in a very specific manner to prevent figments of my imagination from coming into fruition. Over time, I realized that the actual reason as to why I'm late for things held no validity. And that I was better off telling you that my dog ate my homework and that's why I couldn't make it to your wedding than I was telling you that I had to lick a doorknob 28 times. The thing with OCD that I think often goes unexplained, is that if there is a 99% chance that my perceived obsessive fear can't happen, and a 1% chance that it might happen, well, that 1% weighs everything in my OCD brain. So it's going to debilitate me to the point where I will be spending 15 to 18 hours a day trying to find answers with 100% certainty. If this means that I'm going to be late for work, that I'm going to lose my job, that I'm going to drop out of college twice, that I won't be able to hang out with my family for the holidays, then this is the grip that this disorder has on me. I often describe myself to people as a coke's puppet, on call at any time for the demands of OCD. Seeking certainty in a world that exists in complete uncertainty forced me to search for the truth especially since I was having physiological effects, brain palpitations, and I felt as if I could feel the phrenology of my brain sweating on the inside as it panicked to metabolize thoughts. So often I feel violated and threatened by my own mind and unable to explain to people why I can't move on and just let the thought go. It's a feeling of complete and utter powerlessness. And it is so contrasting to my deepest desires of being an empowered and self-actualized individual. A discovery that has changed my life, 
And I hope that you will share it with others you meet along the way who may be suffering in silence, is this. Just because pain doesn't feel good doesn't mean it doesn't have value. I know that all of you in this room can identify with pain because we all know what physical and emotional pain look like. The pain and the humiliation that this disorder has caused me has been the catalyst of my growth today. Pain has been so gripping and threatening to my life that it has literally ignited a fire in me to write out my story. Let me remind you, I'm a person that was working with the top doctors. I was taking medication for over a decade, and I was doing extensive cognitive behavioral therapy and still finding very little relief. So frustrated, I decided to jot down my emotions onto paper. And I couldn't help but notice that my little tiny dabblings looked like a poetic rhythmic flow. Inspired by the cadence of the way words poured out of me, I began to study the ways in which words sounded and interacted together. My use of syntax, sentence layout, and phonetics literally helped dissipate my OCD. It was at that point that I realized that I had to take my pain and transmute it, or essentially change it, into a new form of healing. And for me, this has happened to come in the form of poetry and performance art. And I want to say that just because multiple attempts at trying to heal haven't been successful for you, maybe you've tried other methods, does not mean that there are not infinite ulterior solutions out there for you. And my suggestion is to just be open. You know, pain gets a really bad reputation, but pain has been monumental in my discovery of self and healing. And pain has allowed me to find beauty in very dark spaces. Today, <laughs> I take the things that scare me and I play with these thoughts. I tongue dance with words and I share my story with you right now in hopes that you too will identify and connect with the pain inside of you so that you can find healing, get to know this pain, learn about this pain, this is a part of you. This is transformative, you can change it. I'm gonna leave you with a final poem. The other night I was feeling kind of anxious. So I decided to have a cup of coffee. And lately I've noticed that when my anxiety hits, inside my solar plexus sits. A hidden fear, no time for bliss, an inimical fix, sublime dismissed. A dyspeptic itch of doubt persists, <laughs> gets me every time. Tired of being a puppety mime, it always shows up when I'm not quite aligned. So, like a butler, I wait at its beck and call. No fate nor faith, heart palpitates. A savage, thinking a lot's at stake. That's like ball and chain, I don't stake my claim. Slavery hits and I'm taking all the shame, collecting all the pain, unsound, not sane. Admit me, mom, 5150 me some. Such malice makes me sick. Still stone stuck and ill betwixt the thrill of safety and uncertainty. Such insidious insanity, a purgatory memoir, not complaining but explaining my war, obsessive and compulsive, tumultuous. Brain lock lies that are fictitious, and this ain't some dumb cheap pulp fiction. Or a poem about repeated cleaning and hand washing. It's superstitious, vicious, entirely sick like mischief, and I'm walking to talking TikToks and into the squalor. And you're bound to get a haircut if you hang by the barber parlor, or get your lips wet when you're about to kiss and peck, or get burned quick if you ever play with fire, and I wonder when I'll ever come to. I keep coming in and out a riddle, trying to see my way through. And if I sing me a song, I seem to feel more in tune. You know, poetry helps to assuage all the gloom. I don't need beats with my prose, because I rock it a cappella. But I still wonder when I'll ever come to and surrender to the uncertainty of this black and white hypocrisy. It's murky water for sure. This ain't dreams and folklore, no board game and a winner with a top score. 
More like some Sodom and Gomorrah barbarian uproar, but it's all in my head. See, my brain emits this ego dystonic stint where, well, I get stuck on thoughts and can't quite seem to quit. That's like a sonnet wrapped in some hieroglyphic myth. I translate in phonics while I write what I spit. And most of it's rigmarole and makes little sense. But I'm innocent. I swear. Innocent in this sense. But I'm doing the same thing. Expecting a different result. Some coin this insanity. I keep claiming hope. And if a woodchuck could chuck and woodchuck would, why do I keep praying yet chopping no wood? And God, I don't want to insinuate some perfidious mistake. Don't get it twisted. It's not that I don't love you or think you can't free me. Believe you me, I'm going to leave you this. I don't doubt your capabilities or omnipotence, even with these fumes that reek most potently. But more importantly, I guess it's silly for me to think that I'd be free my way, on my time, the way I'd like to see. So here I go again now, back on my knees. Slapstick humor and a mouthful of please. A garden of Eden. Not a garden I eat in. No gluttony, no greed. No apple, no Eve. This time, you lead. And I'll button my beak even though I'd like to see what's actually foreseen. God, I have a question, just a humble request. I got paper and a pen and a head full of mess, a mind full of thoughts, but not blind to your test. If you gave me life, then who writes the rest? Thank you.